but I'll just start out with um, something that came out of the presentation that you gave it, I annotate. And that was that, um, you know, I think you were kind of drawing attention there to what seems to be like a perceived crisis around reading and writing. Like people are like, oh my gosh, students can't read or write anymore or annotate or whatever. Um, and I, I think you were challenging that in an interesting way. And so I was curious if you, do you think that there's a crisis right now in reading and writing among students or people in general? And if so, uh, or if not, how does annotation kind of play a role in whether there's a crisis or not? I always like to point to a text that kind of changed my thinking about this question, and that's Kathleen Yancey's writing in the 21st century. It's actually quite dated now. I think it came out in maybe 2007, I'm gonna say. But writing in the 21st century by Yancey basically states that students are actually writing more than ever before. If you were to challenge a group of students, which I have, to document how many text messages, Snapchats, IG posts, Facebook posts, tweets, emails, they send out in a day, the sheer volume of writing is staggering. Why we don't value that writing in academia or in higher education is the question for me, <laughs> right? The claims that students aren't writing are just categorically untrue. The fact is that we don't count what they're doing as writing. Right, so it's not a question of volume, it's really, or it's, it's perceived as a question of volume, but in fact, it's actually a question of the value of, of, of the quality or something. Exactly, exactly. Um, and multimodal writing, so writing using images, using videos, using um, even voice um, elements, that has been studied now for decades, um, especially in disability and uh, accessibility studies. Um, Jody Shipka has a beautiful text called Composition Made Whole. And that, I mean, it, it's probably 20 years old at this point. And that was looking at multimodality in terms of like, if I write a poem on my ballet slipper, does that count as writing, <laughs> right? Yeah. Or, or, you know, if I write uh, like, like Emily Dickinson's um, recipes that were poems, right? Um, does that does that count as writing? It's a recipe for you know, whatever bread, right? But it's also a poem. Does that count as writing? Um, so these these questions aren't new. I think they're just it's just the technology through which we are communicating is new. Um, so in that way, this crisis has actually been going on for like twenty years, right, <laughs> or more. Um, do you, almost, do you call it a crisis or? I don't. I don't think there is a. I don't think there is a crisis. There's like a perceived a crisis, right? I think okay. there's a shift. And I think that shift may be more rapid than other shifts that we have seen um, historically. You know, like, for example, the first major shift you can point to in higher ed is, um, you know, when the veterans came back from war and we start open admissions and started, you know, increasing just the volume of people in higher education. That shift was subtle and it took time and it, it you know, slowly moved through different uh, groups of people, right? So first probably a different class, then different genders, then different races, right? Here we have a, a shift that's just happening like across all of, the, of, those, um, of those categories at the same time, right? Access to technology is, is ubiquitous. Um, the Pew, Pew Research says 99.9% .9 of college students have access to a smart device. I mean, that's everyone, right? At least in, uh, in, in, the in the United States. States. In the United right. States, right. Exactly. Um, so in terms of writing, I think that it is not a crisis. I think it is a shift. And I think that we need to move with that shift. And we need to embrace that shift. And we need to meet students where they are, just as we have with open admissions and with these other shifts that we've, um, that we've encountered in higher education over time. In terms of reading, this I got a point to Kathy Davidson for in her um, series of books from Now You See It to um, um, uh, her most recent book on education. The title is escaping me right now. That's but, right, I can look it up. Yeah. Yes, Kathy Davidson's work. Um, she talks a lot about um, multitasking and attention blindness and how students in the 21st century are 
essentially multitasking all the time. And we treat that as a crisis. We say that's a bad thing because they can't focus on one topic. They can't stay um, kind of tunnel visioned to one task, but actually uh, multitasking helps us see more and do more and experience texts and, and tasks in different ways. Um, I'm definitely in her camp when it comes to this. Um, although maybe we're not sitting down to read Pride and Prejudice in one fell swoop. I don't think we ever were, honestly, but... Um, was I it published serially even? Yeah, I guess not. It, 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 wasn't, well, it wasn't Dickens, right? It, no. Uh, yeah, that, this is, that's Austin's, probably not. But anyway, yeah. there's, you know, there's, there's no evidence that anyone was ever deeply reading for hours on end with no interruption, right? Um, all we have is claims from like Plato saying that, you know, writing is going to kill our ability to memorize. And we have these, these kinds of claims, but we don't, we don't have any data to suggest that anyone was ever sitting down and knocking out a novel, right? In, in, in a short period of time. Um, I, I'm totally of the camp um, that our minds have always been wandering, that we've always been distractible, right? That we've always been doodling on the sides of pages or thinking about our lunch or stopping to converse with someone or just look at the trees, right? Um, now we just have distraction that's more readily available and more um, purposely attuned to distracting us, right? Like pop-up ads, notifications, things that quite literally fly across your screen, right? To distract you. That is new, but the fact that we have students who, are built, who have grown up with those and have trained themselves to deal with those in such interesting ways is something that I think we should bring into the classroom and be talking about and thinking critically about, right? So how can we use multitasking as a positive, as a tool, as a skill, rather than, oh, these students are so, have, you know, they're so distracted, they can't focus on anything. Um, why treat it like as an ill, as a, a symptom rather than a benefit, right? It sounds like I'm really hearing from what you're saying that you have a, um, a tendency to try not to blame students for the condition that we find ourselves in, but instead see what they're doing or going through as a, in a positive light and thinking about how we might harness that. Yes. In fact, I call myself a techno optimist, right? Um, I do think we need to be critical of tools. I do think we need to investigate tools and to think about the ethical, um, you know, ramifications and considerations of tools. But I also think that we need to learn how to use them to our benefit, right? Um, this is true of any tool. Look at a hammer. Sure, a hammer can be used to hit someone on the head with, but a hammer can also be used to build a house, right? So <laughs> let's right. think of all of our tools in that way, right? How can we use the tools that we currently have to support and benefit students, not to um, condemn them or blame them or show what they're doing it, it, it is detrimental, right? Yeah, there's been so much, um, you know, like Jesse Stommel is often <laughs> uh, kind of talking about this vein, about how there's such a tendency to blame students or call out students or shame students for the educational situations we find ourselves in. Um, so uh, that resonates with me to like have a different approach to dealing with that situation. And there's also, I think, a lot of parent blaming too, right? Like, oh, these parents gave them iPads when they were six and they had unfettered use of technology and screen time and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, but you know what we like, of course, of course they did, right? right. I mean, the state parents in, in the 60s and the 70s did the same thing with television, right? I mean, it's not, um, I don't like to play the blame game. I don't think the blame game gets us anywhere. Um, what I do like to do is think about how to use these tools effectively and how to make students aware of how they use these technologies. So my students have to do a digital diet in my classes where they track which apps and sites they use over a 48 period, 48 hour period of time. And then they have to choose three of those things to eliminate for 24 hours. And then they have to reflect on that, right? So it's more about this awareness, about this um, identifying and tracking and being mindful of exactly what they're doing and then say, okay, you know what? I did this and 
I did this for 24 hours and you know what, I'm going to go right back to doing what I was doing because it works for me. Good, great. You learned that. Or it's like, actually, I check Facebook 700 times a day. <laughs> I need to eliminate that, right? I need to delete that app from my phone during school year or whatever, right? So that's, that's what I'm really looking for here is not to tell them what they're doing is wrong or bad, but making them aware of what they're doing and how they could perhaps improve those, those habits, right? That makes sense uh, and is, uh, again, really interesting to me. The, um, I don't know, like surfacing and make, helping people make aware of what they're doing as opposed to um, trying to discount it with some sort of nostalgia. Um, so I'm curious to shift. So we're, you know, you've been kind of talking about how um, there's this perceived crisis and some of the strategies you use to change the conversation there <laughs> um, so that it moves away from this idea of a crisis into something else. So how is it that you see annotation as being like a significant tool in, in that work that you're doing to kind of um, uh, argue against this crisis or surface other kinds of um, you know, teaching and learning or awareness and experience? Uh, for me, that comes down to um, the fact that I teach text-based courses. So whether your texts are physical, print-based or digital, you need to know if students are reading and you need to know if they're comprehending what they're reading, right? That's just kind of the foundations of a humanities um, curriculum, right? Read this text and comprehend this text, right? So in order to figure out if students are reading and if they're comprehending, um, I, right, in some ways needs some form of accountability, but I do not think quizzes are necessarily effective and I've moved very far away from quizzes and, and in general things that are punitive, right? I wanna use a carrot, not a stick. I think a quiz is a stick, <laughs> right? Like if you don't do the reading, you're gonna fail this quiz. Um, plus quizzes are very much about that kind of minutia of memorization, like, you know, name these four rivers that were mentioned in chapter three, or, you know, the, what did character X do to character Y on page 42, right? I, I, that's not actually why I'm having students read. I'm having students read so that they can understand conceptual information and apply that information to their lives or their profession, right? So I want to get at those higher order skills, not those lower level skills. So for me, you know, exams, quizzes, that's not gonna get at that. Uh, so I started thinking about ways of kind of tracking student reading or tra tracking student engagement with text in alternative ways. Um, of course, you've got discussion posts and discussion questions and in-class discussion, but no matter what, I, I, I have yet in my, oh gosh, 12, 13 years of teaching, maybe even more, I guess I started teaching in 2006, yeah. Um, I have yet to encounter a class where 100% participation happens in the face-to-face -face classroom. You have students who are shy, you have students who have social anxiety, you have students who are just uncomfortable speaking in those spaces. Um, and the same happens in the digital realm, right? You have students who will give very long, uh, well thought out responses and discussion boards and, the, and discussion posts. And then you have students who, you know, yeah, good idea, <laughs> right? A very uh, brief response. Right. Um, I also have experimented with things like live tweeting readings. So I've had students uh, read a novel and live tweet as they would live tweet like the Super Bowl or the State of the Union address. As they read, they tweet out things that they find surprising or interesting or have questions about or you know, they use hashtag spoiler alert <laughs> for big moments <laughs> in the books. Um, but that's, again, it's giving me kind of a window into their reading process. That's what, I, that's what I'm looking for, is being able to almost see them read, right? Um, and I, I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to sit in their dorm room and look over their shoulder. So how can I see them read? That would be creepy, right? Yes, right. Um, we call it the creepy treehouse effect. In oh, yeah, no. yeah. Yeah, I'm familiar with the creepy treehouse. Yeah. So I don't want to be in their treehouse, but I do want to see how they're interacting with the text, right? So that's where annotation came into play for me. I've always asked students to physically annotate texts when they are print-based. And I actually have like walked around the classroom and looked at their papers to see if there's marks on their papers. And 
that for me is particularly about how they're making marks. Like, are they using highlighters or post-it notes or pens or multi multiple colors? What are they doing? Um, and when I began to realize that not only was I teaching mostly digital texts, but they were encountering digital texts in every discipline in every class, and probably even more importantly, in their personal lives, right? Like they were waking up and looking at digital publications. They weren't waking up and looking at a newspaper. Um, they were encountering digital texts more than physical texts in a, in a wide variety of outlets in their life. So I wanted to think about how I could shift that annotation into the digital space to meet them, to meet them where they were, but also to give them the tools to interact with the kinds of texts that they were encountering. So I think I started actually with Annotation Studio, the MIT Annotation Studio, sure. and, and Google Docs, right? Because uh, at the time I was at a Google campus, <laughs> so we had, you know, Google for Education. Um, and then uh, when I started teaching with uh, WordPress, I was thinking more about like how could we I annotate born digital text that didn't, in a way that wouldn't eliminate the multimodality. So I started teaching digital publishing, and this is where the real turn happened, is thinking about if I take a, a New York Times article, for example, and I cut and paste it into a Word doc, I lose the New York Times, right? I lose the layout, the design, the font, the images, the videos. I lose all of the work that goes into the creation of that digital text. Yes, I still have the words on the page, but aren't all those elements just as vital? And in digital publishing, of course, that's what we talk about, right? We talk about the visual rhetoric of the text being equal to, or if not more important sometimes than the content of the text. Yeah, so, I used to think a lot about how the New York Times, um, you know, their choice for what picture to include with a story or what picture that would be on the homepage without an associated story was, you know, probably a more important editorial choice than the text itself. Yeah, and think about the font. I mean, the New York Times font is iconic, right? It's a Romanesque classical font that any, pretty much anyone in the world could probably identify, right, yeah. as the New York Times text, just as you could look at the text of Vogue, the title of Vogue, right? Um, uh, I, we have a whole unit in my class on fonts and typeface and there's students are baffled by the fact that they can identify text that they never, they subcon only subconsciously noticed. Um, like Wes Anderson, for example, always uses the same font. Wes Anderson font, uses the same font for all of his films. And when you type in any title, it's the Royal Tenenbaums. So they're like, oh yeah, that's Wes Anderson's font, <laughs> right? <laughs> or the Star Wars font. Right, right. Right. Or the show Stranger Things uses the same typeface as Stephen King novels. Brilliant. Huh, Brilliant. Subconsciously, Probably you recognize purpose. that, right? right. Yeah. You don't like say, oh, that's a Stephen King font. But when when you put them together, like, oh yeah, that's why that looks, that reminds me of like 80s horror novels, right? That's why I feel creeped out. Yeah. <laughs> so those, I didn't, I, I wanted to find a tool that allowed my students not only to comment on the actual text, but also on those digital elements, right? Can they talk, comment on the typeface, the color choices, the size of the font, the images, the image placement? because I wanted them to think about designing their own digital texts, right? So they needed to be thoughtful about those elements. So I first started having them make videos, like screen captures of digital texts, where they were like walking me through, like, here's the font choice, here's the video, here's the, you know, hyperlinks, whatever. Um, but I, I found that it was not one size fits all, right? Like not all students wanted to talk me through their process. Some students really wanted to write, especially my, my English and writing majors, right? Who, who find themselves able to communicate in writing differently than they do verbally. Um, so that's when I started looking for like those multiple options and giving them like a series of tools that they could do the assignment with. Um, and one of them was screen capture. One of them was literally like taking a screenshot and then like putting bubbles or like circling things and making arrows and typing. Um, and then I, you know, there was hypothesis. And I was like, oh, this does all of the things that I'm looking for. It allows students to write about different elements of the text. It still allows them to comment in a very traditional kind of annotation way. 
but it also has this amazing added benefit of allowing them to add multimodal elements to the annotations themselves. They can add a link, they can add an image, they can add a video, right, to these conversations in um, exactly the ways that I want them to be doing the work. Like I want them to look up the word and provide me with the definition. I want them to look up a reference. Um, there's one article I have all my students read by Nicholas Carr and the opening paragraph references 2001 A Space Odyssey and none of them have seen it. They, like, yeah. None of them have That's seen it. That's like ancient history Odyssey. for them. Yeah, right. So inevitably half the people in the class link to the trailer or the IMDb page or whatever. And that's actually super helpful, right? And that's something that they couldn't do in, in those other, using those other tools or using, you know, pen and paper. Um, so that's, that was the huge added benefit for me is like, not only were they doing a multimodal project, but then they were able to use these multimodal elements. And it was very like metacognitive and like why multimodality matters and what we can do with multimodal writing that we can't do with static writing, right? Yeah, that's really interesting. You know, we um, at Hypothesis, mostly thanks to Jeremy's work, we have kind of settled on this really short descriptor about um, some of the benefits that Hypothesis annotation can bring. We talk about it um, being able to make reading active, uh, I'm sorry, uh, visible. Mm -hmm. So that kind of gets at your first point about um, you know, like the accountability, yeah. um, what was reading even happening, visible in the sense of like a record of your interaction with the text, and then social as a third kind of element. Um, and it seems clear that you are uh, very uh, active in, in the, um, you know, using annotation as a tool to help <clears throat> make reading um, visible and active. Uh, can you talk a little bit about why it, if it's important for it to be social uh, and, and why, if so? Yes. Um, so I know I talked about this in my book chapter and I talked about this in my presentation, but um, for me at the end of the day, it all comes down to talking about these texts in class, right? But there's limited class time, there's limited class space. And, you know, I think almost all of us are being asked to teach hybrid or fully online classes as well, right? So um, is there a way to take that face-to-face -face interaction, that social interaction, and bring it into the digital space in ways that students are already accustomed to doing? Because they're already used to tweeting at each other, snapping at each other, answering each other's comments, whether it be YouTube or Instagram, right? Um, but we also see the hugely problematic nature of those spaces. I mean, YouTube comments are the worst, right? I mean, for us in higher education, like don't read the comments of a Chronicle article unless you want to, to be depressed for the rest of you know, the week. Yeah. Um, or so, really anything. I mean, almost anything you look at, like, uh, you know, that's what I think is so dangerous about Twitter, especially if you're, oh, yeah. say, a woman or a person of color. It's like you say anything and then the responses can just be so toxic. Exactly. And um, this is really a whole realm of scholarship on digital citizenship, but I always try to like teach my students good digital, to be good digital citizens, right? And if we really want like the ecology of online spaces to change, we have to practice that in our classrooms too. So I was thinking about like, how can I capitalize on these skills students already have, like leaving comments, having online conversations um, to an academic end? Right. Um, so in the live tweeting exercise, I told you I kind of started with that was obvious. Right. I had students, you know, OK, you have to have 10 tweets for every chapter and then you have to reply to three other people's tweets for that chapter. Right. <laughs> Getting them to engage with each other in the ways that they already do, but just trying to show them how they could do it, um, how they could code switch. Right. Don't just use this for social engagement, but also use this for these like practical purposes of finding out more information about this text. And, and reading with your classmates and talking about it with your classmates in the same way you might the Super Bowl, right? Or your favorite show, you know, Game of Thrones finale, right? Um, Spoiler alert. Right, exactly. <laughs> like how can you, you're already doing this. You're already using the internet to talk about cultural objects, right? Um, you're already tweeting using hashtags about, you know, the Game of Thrones finale or whatever it may be. 
So how can I use those same skills, but apply them to a different purpose and show students how to do it kind of thoughtfully and with intention? Um, you know, Hypothesis has that built in, right? It allows students to reply to each other's thoughts and to support each other's work in, in providing information for each other, like crowdsourcing the hard work of reading, right? So they can crowdsource the references, crowdsource the definitions, but also ask questions and, and respond to each other's questions or throw out a, opinions to start debates. Um, I really, really love when I have students like ask kind of those big rhetorical unanswerable questions and see a bunch of other students weigh in. I think that's what the internet's kind of lovely for, right? Is that strange cross-section of opinions that you don't really get anywhere else. Um, and in my, although my classrooms are very diverse, I do every year have, especially women and people of color, write in their final reflection letters, like I should have, I should have talked more, I should have spoken up more, but I was afraid to, or I didn't feel comfortable but the online space gives them a, a different dynamic, right? It's not, it's not their face, it's not their body in the space. So they do have a little bit more freedom to, to express their opinions. And I find that my shy students or my students who have social anxiety have the time to think out and write out their responses in ways that they feel much more comfortable doing than having to be on the spot and like state an opinion, right? Right, yeah. So that, comfortable doing that live face to face but many aren't right that the asynchronous the asynchronous nature of it gives them a little bit more time to think through what they're going to say um and i really do i do think that that particularly benefits students who have social uh, um anxiety or discomfort in whatever way for whatever reason um the, some, of it, some of it brought onto them rather than coming from them. Yeah, and it, I mean, I try not to weigh in until after all the students are finished, but it also does give me the space to answer questions that maybe we don't get to in class, right? We're, you're never gonna answer every single question about a text in, uh, my classes are an hour and 15 minutes long, right? And have then- Have oh, sorry, I was just gonna ask there, have you ever um, reshaped what you were gonna do in class based on the annotations your students made? Yes. My best example of this is E.M. Forrester's The Machine Stops. <laughs> so I start one of my courses with E.M. Forrester's The Machine Stops, which is a very short, short story by a brilliant and beautiful writer, but it's dated, <laughs> very dated in fact. I think it's 1919 was when it was written. And the short story is about living in a world completely run by machines and Ha having absolutely no face-to-face -face interaction whatsoever. Everyone lives in basically pods or cells, right? And communicates totally through like telepresence. Um, and um, there's the one of the, the kind of, you know, main characters kind of rebelling against this and is like, how come I can't just see people and like talk to people and go into the outside world and like live amongst people? And I have students annotate Ian e. Forrester's The Machine Stops. And I, I swear I've done it maybe five or six or seven times. And the same chunk of text is always left unannotated. Every time, same chunk. Interesting. And that chunk of text is full of fake historical references. So they're like made up events. They're not, they didn't really happen in history, but they're part of the dystopian world that Ian e. Forrester's created but they sound like real historical events. They're like perfectly titled to mimic real events in a way that I think students genuinely don't know if they're real or fake. And they get very apprehensive about saying anything about them because they think they just don't know about them. Like they think they happened, but they don't. They go on Wikipedia, they can't find a Wikipedia page for right, it. Right, right, so they feel like, right, like uneducated, right? And they feel like, maybe I'm the only one who doesn't know this thing, right? Right. Um, so I, f after seeing this, this same chunk over and over again, right, not antiated, I immediately go there first now. And I say, okay, so this is one of the things that Ian Forster's playing with here. The whole, this whole world is based on like 
having fake information and regurgitating incorrect information that's provided to you by a big brother type figure. So he's doing that to you, right? Like he's providing you with this fake information with these fake events and expecting you to just go along with it as if they're real in the exact same way he, the characters in the story are, right? So you're falling into the trap that he's basically setting up as, as a vulnerability of humanity. Right, God, you know, the, uh, that's an amazing uh, example. And the, I'm a big Borges fan, as you might be, um, and it makes me think of his short story, Tlan Ukbar, Orbis Sturges, um, you know, wh where there's the encyclopedia with the extra sort of fake information in it. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that story? Um, not, not very familiar with it, but I've, I've seen it referenced many times. And I was just thinking that, um, and maybe this is the wrong direction to take this, but it would be an interesting exercise to have students create Wikipedia pages for the fake events <laughs> in the enforcers. <laughs> Calling yeah. attention to the fact that they're fake, right? Not right. trying to And see how long it takes the internet to notice. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, they, it, it does make sense that Wikipedia could have records on these, right? Mm -hmm. Because people might go there to try to find if that was a true thing or not. Yeah. I mean, maybe that would take all the fun and surprise out of them being in the story and kind of unlookable, upable, but. Yeah, but it is, it does, it just like shows, it shows the mother in the story is like basically a professor of fake news. Like she just spouts fake junk about fake junk, right? Um, a, fo a Fox News watcher. <laughs> and she, her, you know, I think actually students, this is, perhaps unfair to the students without, you know, having their own voices here in this conversation. But I think students actually don't see the irony of the mother immediately. I don't think they realize that that's what she's doing, that she's not actually an expert in some very minute area of research, but that she's actually just like regurgitating junk about, about fake things, right? Um, so that's a really important conversation to have, especially in our current moment of, of even the term fake news being fake. In a lot of yeah, ways. I know it's taking on a fake meaning now. Right, like it, it, information literacy being so essential to education at all levels. So um, yeah, that, I mean, seriously, and it's so, the, the act of social annotation led me to change my lesson about that text because they didn't, they were, they didn't get it. They didn't get that aspect of the story. And I didn't know that they didn't get it until I realized that they wouldn't touch that whole paragraph in the short story. And every other paragraph was like, heavily 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 annotated that was like the only paragraph that has zero highlights right, right. you're like why yeah oh that's really interesting uh interesting anecdote and i mean often i think people think about like looking at the hot spots where annotation is happening a lot without maybe thinking of the reverse case right like why is no annotation happening here i've also um uh you know brought students questions directly into the classroom right so hey look the student asked this question, it has like 10 replies, but we still haven't really settled, right, on an answer, so let's talk about that. Um, and I have also used it, again, to go back to the digital citizen question, as when students do like kind of more like inappropriate things in the online space, I, I, I call, I'm a call out culture person, right? Like, I call them out and I say like, you were talking to this student in a personal way and not about the text. Like, that's not what this is for. Right. Um, let's talk about how there's like an implicit code of conduct here that you were breaching. Um, and it's uncomfortable, but also important. Yeah, to actually address those things in a way that's constructive rather than just like shaming. Well, you better believe that that student's also doing it in lots of other spaces. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. So, I mean. <laughs> If, if they're willing to do it in this coded space. Then. Exactly, exactly. If they're willing to do it like on the course site the professor built for course interactions, you best believe that yeah. there's other aspects of their life that may need this lesson to be learned as well. Yeah, and other, and other arenas. So that uh, kind of leads me to wonder, um, do you grade student annotations as part of, do you count them as part of the graded yeah. assignments in your courses? If I could li live in a grade-free world, I would. If, if my classes could be pass-fail, I'd be in heaven. Because I, I, I honestly think there is just a pass-fail for life, right? Like you're either doing the work or not. 
And if you're doing the work at an average level or you're doing the work at an above average level, will play out in your, you know, future, but it doesn't really matter what group, what, like the grade that I give you, right? Um, I instead use basically kind of like a check plus check, check minus type system. Um, I have different kinds of engagement activities where they either do it or they don't do it, right? So like the live tweeting, you either do it or you don't do it, right? The social annotation, you either do it or you don't do it. Um, things like peer review, you either show up with your paper and you write on someone else's paper or you don't show up with your paper and you don't write on someone else's paper, right? right. Like, there's a better way to be a peer reviewer and there's a worse way to be a peer reviewer, but that's not the point of the class. The class is to learn how to peer review. It's to learn how to read a text. It's to learn how to engage with these texts in a social way. I don't think you should be penalized for not doing it well your first time, right? Do you get, do you get pushback from students around your attitude toward grading? Um, I get questions like, do we get a point for each annotation or whatever? It's like, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the answer that, to be fair, to be honest, I don't actually tell them exactly <laughs> at first. At first, I just tell them, okay, for the rest of this class period, you're going to create five annotations on this article and I'm gonna make sure everyone knows how to do it, right? And that's just an in-class activity. And I think they are accustomed to in-class activities not being graded because that's just like classwork, right? right? So I have them start it in class and then for homework, they have to like finish the task and then do an, a second article, right? So they're, um, I kind of slip it through the cracks at first and then I show them on the group page in Hypothesis, how I can see their names and how many times they've annotated. So in their mind, just that tally mark is like a grade, right? It says, Ayla Castro, five. Right, I need to show up there. Right, and say, so with the live tweets, I do a, a tags explorer, the Google spreadsheet, which takes all of their information and it, and it puts exactly like, you know, Ayla Castro, 12 tweets, right? And I just show them how I collect the data, but I don't tell them necessarily what I do with the data. I just show them that they, the data is being collected so that they are held accountable for that work, but right. I don't tell them it's worth like five points, right? I'm just showing them that they either did it or didn't do it. <laughs> and do they, uh, but the, is there anxiety? It sounds like there's a little bit of anxiety sometimes around exactly how that's all gonna be calculated in the end. Yes, and for those students who are really like push, um, I talk about the, the, the essay work that is then gonna result in it, right? So after they read these three articles and annotate them and respond to each other's annotations, there's then an essay on those three articles where they have to put those three articles in conversation with each other about an argument they're making. And that is the high stakes grade, right? And if you didn't spend the time to do the work to carefully read and annotate the text, your essay is not going to be good. <laughs> it's just or not. It's not going to be as good, certainly, right? Um, because you haven't thoroughly investigated the, the text in a way that will enable you to write a thoughtful essay that puts them in conversation with each other, right? That's cool. Hey, so, uh, and I don't want to make uh, us go over time at all. Um, so, um, I just, I'll try to ask a couple more questions and then I'll also give you a chance to, if you, there was something that you really wanted to make sure that you got across, um, which we can also add later, obviously, but, um, so, uh, you have this, uh, chapter on annotation coming out, right? Or is it already out? It's now? out. Look, here's the book. Woo! Wait, hold <laughs> on. I have to switch back. Nice. Okay. I need to get a copy. Is that's Rutledge? Yeah, unfortunately. I, I, you know, with edited collections, you usually sign on to write a chapter before they tell you the publisher. So Rutledge is more expensive. I'm used sure. to it being an open access. Right, yeah. Journals, right. but that's the chapter. Um, nice. And it's, um, the, whole, the whole text is, you know, digital reading and writing and composition studies, but I think I'm one of the only ones in, in it, about annotation in there, so. Well, we have to make sure that, uh... Hypothesis at least buys a copy. Um, there is, it is funny though, because a lot of these are about that that crisis that you asked me about. Like, you know, the very first chapter says the 
it says the reading problem, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you may be a bit of an outlier in the book. I, I might be, I might be. Um, but I have to say it was like one of those, it was like accepted with very little revision. Like, so they must have, they must have been on board with it. Um, and so it, it, I assume there's an overall editor or editors yeah, for there's the- There's two editors, Mary Lamb and Jennifer Parrott, and both composition people. Um, um, it is, like I said, a little more pricey than I'm used to, but I am allowed to distribute a pre pre publication draft, uh, which after my talk at I annotate six people asked me for. So um, <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to make sure that we up your uh, sales <laughs> numbers too. So I will have hypothesis yeah. by one. Um, uh, how did and how did you how did it come about that? You, were you invited to submit a chapter or how did that come about? Um, there was like a targeted email blast to people who do this kind of work. Um, and I responded with like a general inquiry of like, you know, I did this, I did a presentation on this work at my institution. Um, we have these the diverse perspective forums where faculty like demonstrate something they're doing and kind of talk through the how they theorize what they're doing. So I did, I did, I talked about exactly this like annotation, social annotation, how it's getting students to read and write about what they're reading. And um, I was looking for a home for it. Like I was like, I think this is more than just a talk. I think that this is an article. Um, I was kind of trying to figure out where it should live. Um, and this, you know, this email came through. Um, and you're like, aha. Pounce. Yeah, <laughs> it's, this is exactly what it is. It's digital reading and writing. Right. Um, and to be, I really was looking to front load publications before I went on maternity leave. So I was right. trying to get kind of like a bunch of work that I knew wasn't going to come out for a couple of years, but like finished earlier. Um, so uh, I then wrote the, the draft and I presented it at the Society for Textual Studies to give it an outside audience, like outside of Steven, my university, Stevenson. Um, and it was really well received at STS. Um, and I actually presented it with Andrew Stoffer of Book Traces. So he talked about book traces and then I gave this talk about how I use book traces to talk about social annotation. And it was like a really lovely pairing. Um, so that's after workshopping it at that conference, then it, you know, finished it up and sent it out and now it lives in the world, which is great. Um, awesome. Publication is essential to your practice. <laughs> it is, and I always try to because everyone, 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 everyone asks about the kinds of like innovative teaching work that I do. Like how, how do you use tools, digital tools in the classroom to help students do all this stuff, right? Um, and having book chapters out there is a nice thing to like. Here's my tutorial on that. It's in this book chapter, right? Um, um, instead of having to give the same workshop over and over again, um, the. Yeah premise of this really did come from this collaboration between between Andrew Stoffer and I with Book Traces. Um, you know, thinking about media history and book history and the history of reading, right? Like studying the history of reading. Um, and talking to my students about that long tale of social reading and how reading has not been an isolated personal practice for very long. <laughs> Um, it, it was always social. It, um, the fact that we read in isolation now is almost antithetical to the foundations of reading um, and communication. So trying to think about how we now can, can rejoin and recapture and reclaim that social space of reading, um, especially in the era of Goodreads and Amazon reviews <laughs> and all of these things that students are doing for fun on their own time, right? Like how can we bring that into the classroom and, and um, I don't know, teach it, right? Teach kind of these reading, social reading skills um, and make reading part of their worlds again, part of their everyday like lives again in ways that um, um, are not just about saying this book sucks, I hated it. <laughs> not yeah. just like Yelp reviewing books, but yeah. thinking about like the intention and the purpose and the context and the genre and all of these rhetorical questions that will help inform them and make them better readers and better communicators and like better participants in the social space. Um, so yeah, that's, that was, uh, you know, that's what we were doing in Victorian times, right? That's what we were doing in the 19th century. And now we have this opportunity to do it again in a way that has even more impact. 
Um, I often kind of joke that I think of my, like my goal as a teacher to get people to want to read again, right? Like my students always said, oh, I loved reading as a kid. My parents read to me, my grandparents read to me. I used to love reading. And then after I went to high school and we had to read all these books I hated and now I never read, I never read again, right? And I always think like, okay, so how can I make reading part of their worlds again in a way that's enjoyable and pleasurable and not just something some teacher is making them do for a grade? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I have heard, you know, contemporary students, you know, like K-12 students say that uh, the way annotation is used in some of their classes actually makes them hate not only annotation, but also reading because there's a kind of like, like almost pro forma book report quality to the kind of annotation they're being asked to do. Yeah. Um, Cause there is. I try not to do that. I try to say like, use emojis, use hashtags, use right. slang, like do it your own way. Well, I think the fact that you are also seem to be connecting it to like the digital practices that they already do value and do participate in willingly um, is key to that. And so it's not some sort of separate rarefied activity that's boring or as boring maybe. I mean, I'm sure some of it's still boring to them, right? That's fine. Sure. But at least they might gain a tool to make boring reading easier for them to manage. That's That's good too, right? Like bring hypothesis to your social science or science class and use it to make really boring reading more, you know, more digestible. Cool. That right. works too. Right. Hey, so just to switch gears a little bit, um, what, what has been your experience with or, or connection to research on annotation um, in teaching and learning? Uh, you know, are there, is there research that you've seen happen that you find particularly interesting or noteworthy, or is there research that you think needs to be done that hasn't happened yet? Just kind of sprang that one on you out of left field, but. Um, in my book chapter, I actually cite a lot of research that I think is the kind of research that needs to be done, and that's things like, <laughs> The study I, I pointed to that compared the Blackboard discussion posts to the hypothesis annotations and looked at kind of like the quality and quantity and engagement of those posts. Um, because I, I really don't believe that one size fits all. Like I do not believe that a, a Blackboard course is going to fit every type of teacher and every type of course content. I don't think hypothesis is going to fit every type of course and every type of course content. I think that we needed more studies that are comparing different tools and um, providing like, I always joke about, about this, but it really is like, I want like the Amazon spreadsheet of like, here's four vacuums. And <laughs> here's a checklist of these, like this vacuum does these four things and this vacuum does these three things and this vacuum is a totally different three things, right? Mm -hmm. And you, as a consumer, you can look at that and, and pick which one you want, right? Like, I feel like we are missing that in kind of the educational technology realm that like here, here's a Swiss army knife, right? Of tools. And here's how you can use these different things for different purposes. And here's how you can, it goes back to that small pieces loosely joined that Jeff referenced at the conference, but that's, you know, highly, highly cited. Um, how can we put together a, a a Swiss Army knife, a, a toolbox full of many different tools, but also have that criticism, have that research, have that like breakdown of what these tools do well, what they don't do well, and how students are using them, and like data on how students have used them, and comparing the actual products students create out of these tools. Um, I think a lot of us have anecdotal evidence of that, but I think there could be a lot wider scale kind of studies of that. Um, some of it, which you, I saw at the I Annotate conference, right? Some people were, were looking at like some, some quantified data um, of people using these different tools. But that, I think that would be really helpful, especially because we're always being asked kind of to make the case for the practices we're doing in the classroom. So I have to like, you know, say I'm doing this because here's the evidence that it works, right? Right, even though it seems like you are convinced that it works in your context very well, right? But you have to justify it on another dimension. Right, like even, you know, I'm very excited about the Blackboard plugin 
for a hypothesis. But if I want like, you know, my university to adopt it, that plugin, like I will have to make a case for it, right? And those kinds of studies help me make cases for it outside of like, it works in my classroom with my 15 students, right? So um, yeah, that. Um, also, I really, I really, really wish that there was some more um, attention paid to multimodal writing across the curriculum um, and how, uh, you know, the, the paper that you print from Microsoft Word is not really translating into the way that we write in any other context, <laughs> maybe except for a government memo. <laughs> but like, <laughs> you know, out, out, most workplaces are not producing like these white papers anymore. Um, and most of what we consume isn't that either, right? As right. So if we're not consuming this content and we're not creating this content, then we also can't be interacting with like annotating with a pen and paper, right? So um, thinking about, okay, if we're going to be moving to multimodal composition, how do we engage with multimodal content, right? How, what kind of tools can we use to interact with um, multimodal content? One of the biggest questions in higher ed is grading, right? Like how do you grade multimodal content, right? I use screen capture software to grade multimodal content. Um, at JITP, we actually use Hypothesis to <laughs> provide peer review. Nice. for multimodal content. Um, as a journal, the Journal of Interactive Technology and Pedagogy, as a journal, we have used Hypothesis to provide feedback to authors on their multimodal articles that needed like line by line, like line level um, emendation, but was a website or something. Right. That nature. Hey, so I know we've reached the top of the hour. Um, so I should let you go so you can get on with your time. But if you did want to, if you did at least want to suggest something that I should make sure to include, even if we talk about it asynchronously or something. Yes. And this is something that I don't think comes across in the article or in my talk. And this is that I use hypothesis in different classes for different purposes. So it really is not a one size fits all. And it's not like the same process for every class. In my 100 level class from dealing with like, you know, college freshmen in a mandatory general education course. For that, I am doing very much, you know, make five annotations on this article in a private group, and there's more parameters and there's more guidelines. Um, there's more scaffolding, mm -hmm. right? And then, especially since I have what I like to call repeat customers, <laughs> right? Like I end up getting those same students in my upper level classes, especially English majors, because we're small school, um, I have a totally different process. And there, in those classes, um, they are annotating in public. I, am, I choose articles that already have public annotations on them so that they're responding to people outside of the class. And I have them do a completely private annotation on a, on a resource that is only for their research, right? That they're not actually sharing with anyone. Not so even you. Can, right, so that they can, experience the tool for different purposes. I want them to experience, okay, what's this tool like to like, just to read this article and understand it? What's this tool like to engage in the social conversation? And then what's this tool like to use it for the purposes of research, to use it for the end goal of making like a comprehensive literature review in your upper level kind of high stakes project, right? Um, because I think that using it in different ways for different ends is the best way to have students really integrate it into their own habits, right? If I'm only showing them kind of like one application in one way, then it becomes just a tool for my class. It's just Dr. Pasha's weird thing she has you do, right? But if I can show them different applications of it, then, then one of them might resonate and transfer to a different context. And that's the ultimate goal is to give them tools that will transfer, right? That will lead them outside of my class, that will allow them to better understand texts they encounter across contexts, across disciplines, but also in their lives, right? Uh, at large. So that's, I feel like I never quite there's never the space or time to say, this is what I do in this class, this is what I do in this class, this is what I do in this class. But it is different. I don't, I don't use it in the same way for every group. I don't use it the same way for every subject. Um, 
And I think that's really important when that's an important for me assessment of the tool itself, right? Look, when I'm using a tool, I don't want a unitasker. <laughs> this is like, Alt, do you watch Alton Brown? <laughs> Alton Brown is like a chef um, that has Good Eats and Good Eats is like a show about, it's not just about like here, make this recipe, but it's about like cooking and learning about the way cooking works. It's almost like Bill Nye for cooking, right? Got it. Um, Alton Brown doesn't allow unitaskers in his kitchen, right? So you can't get like a, a strawberry core, like that little thing that just cores your strawberries. That's like, no, you can't use that for anything else. Why would you have that? I don't want a unitasker. I don't want tools in my classroom that will only do one thing, right? I want right. a tool that can be applied to many different situations that can, the student can take and use on their own, which means that it has to be open, it has to be affordable, it has to work across platforms, both um, platforms meaning like Mac versus PC, but also like different browsers and also like mobile versus desktop, you know? Um, could be better there. <laughs> yes, it could. But I mean, there's, that's, these things matter to me. I don't want to give students something that they're going to be priced out of, that they're not going to be able to use outside of my classroom for any number of reasons. And that means for me personally, investigating multiple ways of using it so that I can demonstrate to them its utility, right? Wow, really great stuff. I was completely, uh, completely in love with this conversation. I oh, wish thanks. we could talk forever. Thank you, for, uh, uh, thank you for talking to me. Sorry yeah. about too long. <laughs> oh, gosh, no. I just don't want to take up too much of your day. Um, as we've already made you turn backflips to come to annotate. Um, and if you have one more second, um, if you were going to uh, invent the title of this blog post <laughs> about yourself, do you have you do you have any ideas about like boom what's the headline yeah. you can also think on it if you yeah want. i always think of things like annotation for all right i always think of like things like the i'm always thinking about like how to to make things accessible so like the accessibility of annotation or making annotation accessible or like things about like breaking down the boundaries of the classroom breaking down the walls of the classroom i'm like making making bringing students lives into the classroom and bringing things from the classroom into students lives <laughs> right maybe like breaking boundaries with annotation stuff like stuff like that yeah yeah 